Hey all, we are back with another all content in Smash video, and this time we are going to be looking at a series we don't see many considering despite how big of a franchise it currently is in the gaming industry. This being Bandai Namco and From Software's Dark Souls series. But we didn't do it alone, mainly because I know basically nothing about this series. I know to praise the sun, and that's about it. So this episode is actually guest written by one of our fantastic Discord users, Skilled Crom. So if you have any questions about anything I say today, then join our Discord and discuss it with Crom there. There'll be a link in the description. Anywho, let's rest by the campfire and get into this episode of all content in Smash. Dark Souls, the spiritual successor to Sony and From Software's previous venture Demon's Souls, is a franchise with a high pedigree in the modern gaming landscape. Together with Bloodborne, From Software's other business venture alongside Sony, the so-called Soulsborne line of games has received massive critical and commercial success for things such as the innovative use of online mechanics, popularising of long-forgotten RPG tropes, beautiful interconnected worlds with great level design, fascinating minimalist storytelling, and of course, the punishing and unforgiving challenge. Many game critics and casual fans alike consider the Souls series to be one of the most influential and iconic new IPs introduced in the modern age of video games, and it's easy to see why. Many notable titles have taken influence or inspiration from the tropes that Dark Souls made popular, to the point where people have even begun to get tired and start making jokes about the constant comparisons made between Souls and other games. The competition is incredibly steep but it might not be impossible for Smashes the Dark Souls of crossovers to join the ranks of such infamous news headlines as Crash and Cuphead ones. After all, isn't Souls a series all about underdogs rising up to a challenge? For the series icon, we think the best thing would be the bonfire, an iconic symbol throughout the series. Now before we go any further, we just want to note that since Demon's Souls and Bloodborne are different IPs and are owned by Sony, they unfortunately won't be getting any content at all. This is a Dark Souls only video. So when it comes to choosing a character to represent the Souls series in Smash, the options are a bit difficult to sort through. Solera of Astora is the series all but official mascot, but while he's incredibly iconic, his potential for a moveset is honestly fairly low. Outside of his sword and shield, he only has one interesting spell or technique to his name. He's never really associated with any items with an offensive or defensive use. Artorias, the Abyss Walker, is a fan favourite boss and would have an incredibly unique moveset. Still though, I don't think playing as a huge, powerful, super armoured lich man with a fighting style straight out of Berserk would represent the gameplay of the Soul series very well. When it comes to picking the Smash rep for Dark Souls, thou who are undead art chosen. The fighter would go by the name Chosen Undead in game for all costumes to keep it simple, and would represent the player character of the Dark Souls series. The Chosen Undead from Dark Souls 1, the Bearer of the Curse from Dark Souls 2, and the Ashen One from Dark Souls 3. There's one more costume I haven't mentioned, but we can discuss more about that later. For their moveset, the Chosen Undead would use mostly their sword and shield. Like Hero and the Lynx, this shield would block projectiles when standing, crouching, or walking, as long as the projectile hits them somewhere the shield hurts box covers. But again, like the aforementioned characters, it wouldn't work when attacking or running. Their normal moves and animations would be made up of a mix of moves from both strength and dexterity type swords, with a couple kicks and shield bashes in there. The only exception would be neutral air, which would have them spin the fire whip pyromancy around their body in a circular motion, and their smash attacks. These represent all three games and all three schools of magic. Their side smash would be the soul greatsword sorcery from Dark Souls 2, their up smash would be the combustion pyromancy from the original Dark Souls, and their down smash would be the lightning stake from Dark Souls 3. Now we can move on to their special moves. For their neutral special they wield a staff. Dark Souls has had many options for sorceries that would make for good special moves, but the one I singled out as being both iconic to the series and the most unique is Big Hat Logan's homing soul mass. This sorcery would summon about 5 blue magic orbs to float above the undead's head, which would fire off in the direction of the nearest player when the button is pressed a second time, or after a set amount of time has passed. They deal pathetic knockback, and their automatic aiming isn't guaranteed to hit the opponent, but summoning them for a little burst damage could help the undead control space a bit by giving the threat of a projectile to deal with, and could help them set up for their other moves. Their side special is the iconic Lightning Spear Miracle. With forms of this move used by Gwyn, Solaire of Astera, and the Soul of Cinder, this is one of the better known Souls projectiles. 
While homing soul mass is a fast, low damage ranged option, the lightning spear is a slow, threatening attack and most likely a powerful finishing move if it lands. This would see the undead pull out a bolt of lightning with their talisman and throw it forward in a direction that can be subtly aimed by the player during the move's lengthy windup. It's not the most practical of moves, but certainly one that would really feel good to land. The up special was difficult to choose, but I decided on the homeward bone. This would warp the chosen undead back to the stage, similar to Hero's Zoom. It would pretty much guarantee a safe recovery, but also like Zoom, the spot the undead appears in would be largely random, with only subtle influences from the player making a difference. It would also be heavily telegraphed with a faint glow indicating where the player will respawn. In exchange for its amazing recovery power, its startup can be cancelled by being attacked. You may have noticed that the way I'm describing the Chosen Undead seems very high risk, high reward. Combine this with their more than likely slow attack speed, average running speed and mediocre jump height, they would be instant bottom tiers on release, right? Well that's where their down special comes in, and it's also their special gimmick, the Estus Flask, an undead favourite. In Dark Souls, this item is your limited healing resource, which refills on death or when resting at a bonfire. In Smash, using this move would heal the undead, supporting their defensive, patient playstyle and helping with their glaring weaknesses, not to mention helping them represent the gameplay flow of Dark Souls just that much more. It wouldn't heal them a ridiculous amount, Hero's Heal spell, another limited use healing move, is about 11% and the casting animation is much quicker, so about 20% health per use seems fair to me. This would reward the Chosen Undead for creating space between their opponents or scoring a KO. Just like the default in Dark Souls 1, you'd only get 5 per life and they would refill on death. Just don't get greedy as you leave yourself open to attack when you stop for a glass of Sunny D, and any Souls player can warn you about what happens when you do that. Their final smash would be called Link the Flame. It would start with them casting Soul Stream, a sorcery from 3 which is basically a Kamehameha or fighting game beam super. If it hits an opponent, they're sent into the kiln of the first flame, where the undead lights the last bonfire and links the flames, filling the kiln with an explosion of fire just like in one of the Dark Souls endings. It would probably instantly KO any fighter caught in it above 100%, like certain other final smashes. Now that the moveset is finally done, we can take a look at those alternative costumes I teased earlier. These costumes would all use the male builds as a base, but to keep their identities open to interpretation, they would use Dark Souls hit sounds and the famous you died noise rather than grunting and shouting themselves. The first costume is the Chosen Undead from Dark Souls 1, wearing the elite knight set seen on Oscar of Astora and all over promo material for that game. They wield the Astora straight sword and the crest shield. The second costume is a recolor of the elite knight set with a tan color to the metal and black and brown color to the cloth. It's based on Sigmire of Katarina as well as his daughter Sieglind, and their eventual spiritual successor Siegvod, who both wear the same armour. The third costume is based on the Bearer of the Curse from Dark Souls 2 and wears the Farum Knight set used in that game's promo material. They wield the Longsword and the Golden Wing Shield. The fourth costume is a recolour of the Farum set based on Solera of Astora, which colours the fur on the shoulders green, the chest plate and lower cloth white, and the crest atop their helmet red. The fifth costume is the Firelink armour set from Dark Souls 3. This armour is associated mostly with the final boss of the game rather than the Ashen one, but it's the game's closest equivalent to the two previous armours and shares that role in the promotional material and trailers. They use the Longsword and the Knight's Shield. The sixth costume is a recolour of the Firelink armour set that turns it gold and red, a reference to the Dragon Slayer Ornstein. It also doubles as a reference to Dark Souls 3's promotional material, which featured this armour set bathed in heavy yellow hues. Now for the last alternative model. I originally wanted to use Solaire, but I ran into trouble due to the same reasons I decided to not make him the character. It just isn't in Solaire's character to be using sorcery, pyromancy and the like, as those have a heavy lore association with certain personality traits. I eventually decided on an undead wearing the Black Knight armour. Black Knights are an extremely iconic mini-boss in Dark Souls 1 and 3 and share a lot of promotional spotlight for the first game with Solaire in the Elite Knight set, and their armour can be used by anyone without having the connotation of a specific NPC character involved. The final costume recolours the Black Knight armour to be a shining elegant silver. This costume references the Silver Knights, an alternative version of the Black Knights which appear as the Guardians of Anor Londo in both Dark Souls 1 and 3. Speaking of Anor Londo, that was the location we chose to be Dark Souls' stage. 
Alongside the Firelink Shrine, it's one of the only locations to appear in more than one Souls game by name, but unlike Firelink Shrine, both versions of Anor Londo are undoubtedly the same place. It's also one of the most beloved areas in the series by far, and several NPC questlines come together in this location, making it ripe for stage cameos. The stage itself would take place on a platform designed after the rotating elevator platform present in both versions, only with the roof removed and a flat horizontal platform taking its place. The background would feature the central chapel, and the areas connected to the left and right by stairs would be extended out to give the fighters three platforms to fight on. Like Mementos, it would have different forms with their own unique textures and lighting, being the pristine form from the first game and its frozen shell seen in the third. Which version appears is purely random, and the differences are also purely aesthetic. The flow of time is convoluted in your ground, with heroes centuries old fading in and out. As such, there are a number of cameos on this stage, each with a random chance of appearing based on what form the stage takes. The cameos likelier on the sunlit form consist of characters from the first game, Solera of Astora, Sigmire of Katarina, Lutric of Karim, Dragonslayer Ornstein, Executioner Smau, and Dark Sun Gwyndolin. Cameos likelier on the Boreal Valley form are characters from the sequels, the Emerald Herald and Lucetiel of Mira from Dark Souls 2, as well as Pontiff Sylvan, the Firekeeper, Yuria of Londor, and Unbreakable Patches from Dark Souls 3. Patches is actually a unique case as an alternative version of him appears in every Soulsborne game, except Dark Souls 2, and it's heavily implied the version of him in 3 is the same character as his Dark Souls 1 counterpart, still up to his old tricks thousands of years later. What a legend. But what would a stage be without music though? Hannenbau, that, that's what it would be, and we don't want Hannenbau again now, do we? The problem is, while Soulsborne has plenty of fantastic arrangements, most of them are either slow and emotional symphonies, or bombastic orchestral scores. Great stuff, but with the exception of one song from Dark Souls 3 and a couple of Bloodborne tracks, none of it is going into my certified bangers playlist. Because of this, I've marked a pretty high number of these as remixes. We're aware it's a bit self-indulgent, but many of these tracks have incredible melodies which could easily be retrofitted into amazing remixes when put into a more smashy context. I'll let you be the judge of this decision though. Have a listen for yourself.
Chosen Undead's classic mode is called Jolly Cooperation. You fight against characters similar to Dark Souls bosses on medieval fantasy type stages. In each of the battles, a character will interrupt who is based on one of the Soul series online covenants, the colour coded gangs that dictate the way the online mechanics work in the Souls games. Battle 1 is against Bowser on Arena Ferox. You're aided by a Link using the White Skyloft costume, a reference to the way of the White Covenant that all friendly phantoms start as by default. The music is the Dark Souls 3 main theme. Battle 2 is against two Falcos on Castle Siege. The player is aided by a Chosen Undead with the Golden status effect. This battle represents the Warriors of Sunlight who aid fellow players in their quests, and the music is the Tauros Demon theme. Battle 3 is against Ike on Arena Ferox. He's assisted by a Robin with a red ult, who represents the aggressive Phantom Covenant such as Dark Wraiths that invade and attack other players in all three games. The music is Artorius's theme. Battle 4 is against Meta Knight using the Dark Meta Knight skin on a Nova Pokemon League. A Red Lucina attacks you, but this time you're allied with a Blue Pit. This represents the Blue Sentinels, a covenant in Dark Souls 2 and 3, that tracks down evil Red Phantoms and enacts justice upon them. The music is Sir Alon's theme. Battle 5 is a battle against Ridley on Hyrule Temple Battlefield. A purple Dark Pit joins the battle as neither an ally nor friend, and will attack both Ridley and the player indiscriminately. This is a reference to the Mad Phantoms from 3 that can choose to attack or assist the player depending on their mood. The music is Slave Knight's Gale's theme. Battle 6 is a fight against a blue Palutena and two blue Richters on an Orlando, and represents the Dark Moon Blade Covenant that defends an Orlando and tracks down players who commit sins on behalf of the Dark Sun Gwendolyn. Music is Ornstein and Smau. Then we have the bonus round before reaching Battle 7, a battle against Dracula. FromSoft games have a recurring trend of final battles against extremely powerful old men with white hair, and we aren't about to break a trend like that now, are we? The player is assisted by a chosen undead using the Solaire themed ult, a reference to how Solaire can be summoned to help the player against Gwyn in the first Dark Souls game. The music is Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. Each form of the chosen undead would have their own fighter spirit, using promo art from all three games and for the Black Knight enemies respectively. Most Souls characters lack official art, meaning their spirits would use their Smash 3D renders made for the stage cameos or concept art if they lack that. Let's start with the small fry and work our way up. Lortric of Karim is a novice support spirit. He's fought on an Orlando and is represented by Dark Pit with the gold outfit. He's supported by two Robins using the white robes costumes. Spirit effects raise your stamina in stamina battles, a reference to the Ring of Favor and protection he drops. The Emerald Herald is another novice support spirit, this time represented by Zelda with the green costume on the Omega form of Hyrule Temple. She will avoid combat and be defended by a chosen undead using the default Fire Knight skin. Her spirit effect gives magic attack up. Siegmire of Katarina is an advanced defense type spirit. For his battle, he is represented by King K. Rule with the white costume, holding a killing edge. The fight takes place on Norfair, and hostile yellow Ridleys may occasionally appear and attack indiscriminately. His spirit raises the user's weight when equipped, in reference to his heavy armor set. Dragon Slayer Ornstein is an advanced support spirit. He is fought as Fox with the yellow costume, supported by King K. Rule with his own matching yellow costume. The fight takes place in an Orlando. The floor is electrified and King K. Rool spawns with an ore club. Ornstein's Leo ring boosts the player's counter damage, but Smash doesn't have an existing effect for that, so here he gives you the perfect shield reflect ability. Aldia, Scholar of the First Sin, is an advanced grab type spirit, the true final boss of Dark Souls 2's expansion, Scholar of the First Sin. He takes the form of Ridley with the green costume on Reset Bomb Forest Omega form. Floor is lava and Ridley will prioritise using Down Special, his spirit boosts magic attacks. Lorien, Elder Prince and Lothric, Younger Prince, are an ace attack type spirit. The penultimate bosses of the third game, Lorien is represented by Krom with the black and yellow skin on Dracula's castle, holding a fire bar. When he is defeated, he revives and is joined by a Robin with the blue costume that avoids the player and tries to fight from a distance, representing Lothric. Their primary spirit effect also boosts magic attack. Artorias, the Abyss Walker, is an ace defense spirit. He takes the form of a giant Ike wearing the blue costume on Arena Ferox. After taking a certain amount of damage, he is supported by Wolf with a blue costume holding a killing edge, representing Sif. His spirit boosts sword attacks when equipped. Solera of Astora is an ace support spirit. His spirit battle is against a chosen undead, using the Solera themed costume for Faramite. Fight takes place on Hyrule Temple and he tries to use side B constantly. 
At random intervals, swordsmen with the gold status effect will join as a reference to Solaire's Covenant, the Warriors of Sunlight. His spirit effect boosts the power of the user's side special. The final spirit is Gwyn, Lord of Cinder, the final boss of Dark Souls. He's a legend support spirit like the other DLC legend spirits. He's represented by giant Ganondorf using his 8th costume on the Colosseum stage. His smash attacks have boosted damage and charge speed, and his speed and jump height are slightly increased. In keeping with the others having unique spirit effects, this spirit provides a double boost to fire explosion attacks. Last but not least, this brings us to the Mii costumes. As Dark Souls is mostly known for its sword wielders, both full costumes I chose were Mii sword fighters, being a costume based on Solera Vastora and a costume based on Artorias the Abyss Walker. Both characters I initially considered for a playable role. However, it would also be great to see a Mii hat based on the symbol of Avarice, which, like in the games themselves, would give the appearance of the wearer's head being a mimic. That's it for my take on all of the Dark Souls content we could see in Smash. There's a clear bias towards Dark Souls 1, but that's to be expected as it's the fan favourite and the most beloved and iconic of the bunch. You could make the argument Dark Souls 3 gets too much in comparison to 2, but I would argue that's mostly a result of 3 continuing on the storylines and themes of 1 directly, while 2 is much more of its own thing, meaning it's got the least recurring elements. And that will do it for this episode, so once again I want to thank Skilled Chrom for helping us write the script for this. Without him, um, Dark Souls may not have come for a very long time. I mean, it certainly wouldn't have been me doing it, I can tell you that. But if you would like to get involved and are interested in submitting your own all content, then join our Discord, or better yet, subscribe to our Patreon, as the Patreons can uh, request what we do next. Right now you'll see our $5 and above patrons on screen, but you only have to sign up for a dollar. If you do want to go higher, we'll appreciate it, but there's no forcing here. What we would like you to do is get up from this campfire and share this video with as many people as you know. Help spread awareness of it and keep the series going. With that guys, like, comment and subscribe, and always remember to return to the source.